Hi, uh, my name is uh, Daniele Casari and I'm a researcher in the field of material science uh, uh, with focus on metallurgy. I'm a postdoctoral research uh, fellow at the uh, Department of Physics uh, of the Univer Norwegian University of Science and Technology and I contribute to the project called uh, Hexomet whose main objectives are to develop uh, new casting processes and new alloys, uh, uh, aluminium and magnesium casting alloys with enhanced mechanical properties at room and high temperature. My research uh, focuses on uh, the comprehension of the phenomena involved uh, in um, solidification and microstructure evolution of uh, magnesium and aluminium casting alloys. Advanced uh, characterization techniques uh, are used, uh, such as uh, uh, in situ and uh, synchrotron uh, X-ray imaging techniques. In this uh, lecture, I'm uh, going to illustrate the potential of uh, X-ray microscopy as a tool uh, for improving the scientific understanding of solidification in metallic alloys. A uh, mention will also be given to metal matrix composite uh, and to the promising use uh, of uh, this technique uh, to understand the uh, solidification phenomena that uh, occur in uh, such class of materials. This presentation is addressed uh, uh, to a general audience, but it may be most enjoyable if you have basic understanding of uh, X-ray physics uh, and metallurgy. Mechanical performances of uh, cast components commonly used in automotive and aerospace industries, uh, such as uh, engine blocks, uh, wheels uh, and uh, airplane parts, uh, depend uh, on their microstructure to a large extent, uh, which is uh, the result of solidification process. Accordingly, uh, there is a strong uh, industrial and academic uh, motivation for uh, uh, a better understanding of uh, and control over the fundamental aspects of uh, solidification. Over recent decades, uh, advances in uh, theories and uh, computational resources have boosted the development of uh, solidification suits devoted to the design and turning of uh, casting processes. These advanced modeling programs are able to predict uh, microstructure formation uh, in two or three dimensions and uh, also several phenomena occurring during solidification, such as uh, porosity or segregation, spanning uh, length scale from uh, the atomic to the macroscopic. Most uh, recent models uh, are based on adaptive mesh uh, refinement. Uh, by adapting uh, the grid resolution uh, to the areas where uh, um, there are significant variations in uh, temperature and phase fields, uh, such as uh, at the um, uh, solidification front. Uh, this model enabled a remarkable uh, increase in the scale of the microstructure that could be simulated and at uh, significantly reduced the simulation times. While computer simulations have been uh, firmly established, uh, there is a lack of in situ experimental data to guide the theory and modeling of metal solidification. Experimental methods that have traditionally been used to investigate how microstructures of metals develop during uh, solidification include first uh, post-solidification metallographic investigations either ex situ after a completed solidification or with alloys that have been quenched or decanted during uh, solidification, respectively to detect uh, transients or coarsening microstructures. Second, transparent uh, compounds such as ice have also been extensively used uh, as analog systems that can be studied in situ under microscope. However, similarity between uh, the transparent system and the metallic alloy system is not uh, obvious and almost uh, never perfect, since various uh, relevant physical properties of these organic compounds differ clearly from those found in metals. Therefore, all these methods uh, have uh, significant uh, shortcomings uh, in uh, providing information about the dynamic phenomena involved in uh, metal solidification. Metal transparency and the interaction with the X-rays constitute uh, candidate principles from which uh, methods for in situ monitoring of uh, solidification processes can be constructed. X-ray video microscopy techniques uh, based uh, on uh, time-resolved uh, high-resolution X-ray transmission imaging have thus uh, been uh, developed. These uh, techniques uh, uh, represent a very powerful tool to investigate uh, solidification directly in uh, uh, metallic alloy systems. What are X-rays? X-rays are a form of uh, electromagnetic radiation as are visible light uh, 
microwaves, uh, radio waves, uh, infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and uh, gamma rays. Scientists uh, usually refer to X-rays in terms of their energy rather than their wavelength. This is partially because X-rays have uh, very small wavelengths uh, between 0.03 and 3 nanometers, so small that some X-rays are no bigger than a single atom of many elements. X-ray energies range from 100 electron volt soft X-rays to 200 kilo electron volt hard X-rays. Because of their energies, uh, hard X-rays can penetrate deeper into matter than soft X-rays. Relevant uses of X-rays uh, include uh, crystallography, the pattern produced by the diffraction of X-rays uh, through the lattice of atoms in a crystal is recorded and then analyzed uh, to reveal uh, the nature of that lattice in terms uh, of uh, atomic uh, arrangements, chemical bonds uh, and various other information. Imaging. X-rays have been used uh, for medical imaging since their discovery. Bones uh, were easily distinguishable from soft tissues on the film that was available at that time. Nowadays, it is possible to distinguish increasingly fine detail and subtle differences in tissue density, while using much lower exposure levels. A further application of X-rays in medical imaging is computed tomography, which combines multiple 2D X-ray images into a 3D model of a region of interest. Due to their ability to penetrate certain metals, uh, X-rays uh, are used uh, for a number of uh, non-destructive evaluation and testing applications, particularly for identifying flaws or cracks in structural components. X-rays are also essential for transportation security inspection of cargo, luggage and passengers. Fluorescence and astronomy. In X-ray fluorescence, uh, X-rays are generated within a specimen and detected. The outgoing energy of the X-ray can be used to identify the composition of the sample. Finally, in X-ray astronomy, important information such as composition, temperature and density of distant uh, celestial objects are obtained from their X-ray emissions. In the history of X-rays, there are some notable dates that must be mentioned. In 1895, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen discovers mysterious rays capable of passing through the human body. Because of their unknown nature, he called them X-rays. In 1912, Max von Laue and Paul Knipping obtained the first diffraction pattern of a crystal using X-rays, giving birth to the field of X-ray crystallography. In 1915, William Henry Bragg and his son, William Lawrence Bragg, are awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for demonstrating the usefulness of the phenomenon discovered by von Laue in studying the internal structure of crystals. In the 1950s, uh, the first commercial X-ray microscopes are developed. In 1953, the structure of DNA is uh, solved by James Watson, a biologist, and uh, Francis Crick, a physicist, thanks uh, to the use of X-rays. Although these results were remarkable, the X-ray tubes uh, used at that time were limited. The light was emitted in all directions with no possibility of focusing it or making the rays parallel. This light was also only intense at particular wavelengths, which restricted its use, particularly in the field of spectroscopy. Synchrotron radiation was observed uh, for the first time in the United States in 1947 in a type of uh, particle accelerator called uh, synchrotron. It was uh, first considered a nuisance because it caused uh, the particles to lose energy, but it was then recognized in the 1960s as uh, light with exceptional properties that overcame the shortcomings of X-ray tubes. In the mid to late uh, 1970s, scientists uh, began to discuss ideas uh, for using synchrotrons as an alternative source uh, to produce extremely bright X-rays. These discussions led to the construction in the late uh, 80s and early 90s of the ESRF, European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, and shortly thereafter two other third-generation synchrotrons, the Advanced Photon Source in the United States and Spring 8 in Japan, were built. In 1999, the first work on X-ray video microscopy of metal solidification with adequate uh, spatiotemporal resolution using synchrotron X-ray source is published. Temporal resolution in the fraction of a second and spatial resolution in the order of micrometers. X-rays abound around us and X-ray sources can be both natural and artificial. 
A synchrotron X-ray source is a, a power, an extremely powerful source of artificial X-rays. In uh, synchrotron machines, uh, electrons are accelerated to very high energy and then uh, periodically deviated to follow a circular trajectory. When uh, electrons uh, change uh, direction, they emit uh, energy. If they are fast enough, uh, the emitted energy is at the X-ray wavelength. How does a synchrotron work? Electrons emitted by an electron gun are first uh, accelerated in a linear accelerator called the uh, LINAC and then transmitted to a circular accelerator, the booster synchrotron, where they reach an energy level of 6 billion electron volts. These high energy electrons are then injected into a large storage ring, where they circulate in a vacuum environment at a constant energy for many hours. Each time these electrons pass through an ondulator, a device consisting of a series of alternating magnets, they emit X-rays, which are directed along beam lines. A beamline generally consists of uh, three sections. In the optics cabin, specialized mirrors and crystal optics are used to modify the raw X-ray beam provided by the accelerator. In the experimental cabin, the beamline provides a way to put the sample uh, of the material in the X-ray beam. Depending on the experiment, the sample might be in the open air or cooled by a jet of liquid nitrogen or helium or contained within a custom design chamber that controls the experimental conditions. Various detectors that capture and record the X-rays that pass through or reflect from the sample are also placed in this room. In the control cabin, experimenters control the position of the sample, adjust the beam and record data. Contrary to uh, synchrotron sources, uh, which uh, provide uh, a nearly parallel beam geometry, microfocus X-ray sources uh, produce a comb beam. The most important parts of the microfocus X-ray source are the transmission target and the focal spot, or source size. In a microfocus X-ray source, a focused electron beam is the transmission target. Depending on the specific application, transmission targets can be made of different kinds of materials, thus selecting specific X-ray emission spectra. The size of the focal spot defines the sharpness of the resulting X-ray image. The bigger the focal spot, the higher the geometric unsharpness, which means that high-resolution X-ray analysis require an appropriately small focal spot. Current microfocus X-ray sources guarantee high brilliance, small source size, low maintenance needs, and low power consumption. This is the X-ray on the laboratory setup currently in use at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. An environmentally controlled chamber has been designed to perform the experiments under nitrogen and argon atmosphere. This allows a delayed oxidation of the samples, which lasts much longer than in an oxygen atmosphere. The microfocus X-ray source is equipped with a thin layer of molybdenum as a transmission target. Molybdenum was selected as target material because the most prominent energy in the X-ray emission spectrum offers a high contrast when uh, copper-containing uh, aluminium alloys are used. The detector comprises a digital camera with a CCD sensor adapted for X-ray usage. A scintillator plate placed uh, in front of the optical fiber converts uh, X-ray radiation to visible spectrum light. The gradient furnace is of uh, Bridgman type, with two identical heaters for the hot and cold zones. The heaters are independently regulated via software. Two thermocouples in each heater measure the temperature close to the crucible and serve as input for the temperature regulation. The gap between heaters has a hole for the X-ray radiation transmission. In a typical solidification experiment, the sample is placed in the furnace and melted. After that, the specimen is solidified by operating on different parameters for example, the cooling rate or the pulling speed, in case directional solidification is investigated. And the formation and evolution of the microstructure is detected through both transmission absorption and phase contrast, namely through differences in composition and density between the liquid and the microstructural constituents. The solidification of the metal is recorded and digitalized. A spatial resolution up to 4 micrometers can be achieved under particular circumstances, which means that every pixel has a size of 4 by 4 micrometers. 
subsequent image processing through specifically developed routines can significantly improve the quality of the recorded radiographs. I'm going now to show you a few solidification experiments of metallic alloys. Uh, uh, images uh, were taken using uh, either synchrotron or uh, microfocus X-ray sources. The first uh, video shows uh, columnar dendritic and uh, eutectic growth in uh, aluminium 30 weight percent copper alloy, directionally solidified with the temperature gradient parallel to gravity. A dendrite in metallurgy is a characteristic tree-like stru crystal structure growing as uh, molten metal freezes. Its shape is a result of uh, faster growth along uh, energetically favorable crystallographic directions. The requirement is that the liquid, the molten material, is undercooled below the freezing point of the solid. While dendrites grow, copper is rejected at the solid-liquid interface, so that its concentration in the vicinity of the dendrites increases. At the dendritic solid-liquid interface, both phase shift and absorption contribute to the contrast due to the presence of copper. The absorption contrast available also allows for a direct visualization of the solute field in the liquid iod of the dendrites. The mesoscopic variations in this solute field are due to melt flows pluming out of the interdendritic columns into the liquid region ahead of the columnar front. The presence of a thermosolutal flow promotes a local destabilization of the solute boundary layer forming ahead of the solid liquid interface, making it difficult for dendrites to achieve a steady state growth. A further front is also visible due to phase contrast as a near horizontal line across the images. Here a eutectic reaction is taking place. During this reaction, the liquid and two solid phases, aluminium and an aluminium copper containing phase, coexist at the same time and are in chemical equilibrium. At a later stage, it can be also observed that one of the primary dendrite tips has been overrun by side branching from the neighbor dendrites getting caught up by the eutectic front. So in this first video we showed uh, uh, columnar growth in an aluminium 30 weight percent copper alloy with the temperature gradient set parallel to gravity. Then uh, we observed that uh, copper addition guarantees an adequate uh, absorption contrast. Uh, also it allows to observe uh, mesoscopic uh, variations in the solute field. Finally it is also observed that it is difficult to achieve a steady state growth due to thermosolutal flow. Several valuable data, including the solute concentration field, the morphology of the solid liquid interface, and the liquid flow velocity field, can be acquired from this video and used to test and validate the current solidification models. In the previous video, columnar crystals were observed to grow downwards, parallel to gravity. In experiments where columnar gr crystals grow antiparallel to gravity, the dendrites often fragment and sometimes these fragments survive, as we will observe in this video. In particular, the video shows dendrite fragmentation in an aluminium 20 weight percent copper alloy. The fragmentation in this material can be attributed to the heavier solute element copper that is rejected from the tip of the developing solid phase and flows into the mesh. This causes ternary arms to melt at their root. The melting point shifts uh, to low temperatures uh, due to the higher solute concentration. Since uh, this uh, fragmentation occurs uh, close to the front, uh, the fragments can be transported by buoyancy forces out of the highly permeable mesh. When the fragments reach into the region ahead of the columnar front, they grow by consumption of the local solvent. Consequently, even more solute is accumulated along the trajectory of the initial fragment, which settles into the interdendritic column, causing a cascade of secondary fragments detaching in the wake of the initial one. Eventually, this cascade of secondary fragments spreads laterally across the field of view and the columnar front is completely blocked from further growth. The irregular microstructures forming after fragmentation are believed to represent the initial stages of a columnar to equiaxed transition, a variation in the morphology of the dendrites that can be usually observed in many castings. In this uh, second experiment, I showed the dendrite fragmentation and the columnar to equiaxed transition in an aluminium 20 weight percent copper alloy. In this case, the temperature gradient was set anti parallel to gravity. 
fragmentation uh, can be attributed to the heavier solute copper that is rejected and flows into the mesh, causing uh, ternary arms uh, to melt at their roots. The first uh, fragmentation is not an isolated event, but uh, generates a cascade of fragments that accumulate ahead of the front. These fragments block the columnar front from further growth, leading to a columnar to equiaxed transition, namely to a variation in the morphology of the dendrites. The third and last experiment I'm going to introduce shows a droplet formation, motion and coagulation and monotectic solidification in a hypermonotectic aluminium 6 weight percent bismuth alloy. At the hypermonotectic composition, the components form a liquid phase that is completely miscible above a specific temperature. Below this temperature, a liquid-liquid phase separation into an aluminium-rich primary melt that contains droplets of a secondary, darker, bismuth-rich liquid phase takes place. The solid-liquid interface is observed when the temperature decreases further and approaches the monotactic reaction. As the size of the droplet increases due to coagulation, they are set in collective motion by a combination of external forces, that is, gravity, thermal Marangoni force, which is related to the surface tensions of the two liquids, and Stokes drag. When solidification is anti-parallel to gravity, as in the case shown here, there will be a certain droplet size regime where the Marangoni force uh, supersedes the combination of gravity and Stokes friction. Thus, if the temperature gradient is adequately high, the bismuth droplets will be set in motion anti-parallel to gravity, and as they move toward higher temperature, they may grow in size by coagulation or by accumulation of other droplets. At the same time, other droplets may dissolve again in the liquid. Altogether, there are now two possible outcomes for the droplet motion, coagulation and dissolution. Therefore, either the droplets remain within a size regime where Marangoni motion dominates, or they grow large enough for gravity settlement to become dominant. In this uh, third video, I showed uh, uh, phase separation during uh, monotectic solidification of uh, an aluminium 6 weight percent bismuth alloy. Again, the temperature gradient was set anti-parallel to gravity. As the melt uh, cools down, a uh, liquid-liquid phase separation in an aluminium rich uh, uh, primary melt containing uh, droplets uh, of uh, a bismuth rich uh, uh, secondary phase uh, is observed. A combination of forces acts uh, on the droplets as their size increases, namely gravity, Marangoni force, and Stokes drag. Depending on the size of the droplets, they can be transported by Marangoni motion or settle. Another important feature shown in this experiment is the fundamental role of hydrodynamics on coagulation in immiscible systems, which must be taken into account when modeling solidification in such systems. Therefore, X-ray uh, video microscopy is a very powerful tool to investigate solidification phenomena occurring in different uh, metallic alloy systems, but how can we meaningfully use this instrument to investigate uh, solidification and microstructure evolution in uh, metal matrix composite materials? A metal matrix uh, composite, uh, also called MMC, is a material consisting of uh, at least two constituent parts, a metal matrix and a reinforcing constituent, normally ceramic, such as silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, etc. Also, the reinforcement can sometimes be metallic. There are three kinds of metal matrix composites, particle reinforced MMCs, short fiber or visker reinforced MMCs, and uh, continuous fiber or sheet reinforced MMCs. The reinforcement of metals can have uh, many different objectives, for example, increased mechanical properties at room and elevated temperatures, or improve uh, fatigue, wear, and corrosion behavior. The density of these uh, reinforcing constituents is slightly higher than that of aluminum or magnesium. As a result, uh, the weight of the MMC component increases to a small extent. However, this drawback is generally considered negligible compared to the superior mechanical properties given by the addition. I will now show some applications of metal matrix composites. Rotor brake disc is an example of particle reinforced MMC. Traditionally, brake rotor discs are made of cast iron, which has good wear resistance and thermal stability. However, a low density is particularly desirable in rotating components of this type. 
making replacement with aluminium-based MMCs highly attractive. Obviously, excellent wear resistance is also required. A metal matrix composite consisting of aluminium 10 weight percent silicon with 20 weight percent silicon carbide particles was found to be the ideal candidate for this application. Piston is an example of a metal matrix composite reinforced with short fibers. Inserting a 5 weight percent alumina short fiber in pistons can reduce wear by over four times and double scissor stress between piston and cylinder compared to the unreinforced aluminium alloy. Finally, superconducting magnets can be considered as an example of long fiber MMCs. Niobium titanium filaments are usually embedded in a copper matrix to produce superconducting magnets for magnetically levitated trains. There are different ways for producing metal matrix composites. However, just the casting will be considered in this science lecture as it involves a solidification process that can be investigated via X-ray microscopy. A basic concept to know in casting of metal matrix composites is wettability, which is the ability of the liquid metal to wet the solid surface of the reinforcing constituent. Wettability is conveniently given in terms of a contact angle theta, as uh, schematically shown in the figure. For a specific solid-liquid system, the contact angle depends on the energetics of that system, and in equilibrium it is uh, gamma LV times cos theta, is equal to gamma SV minus gamma SL, where the first term is the surface tension of the liquid, the second term is the surface energy of the solid, and the third term is the solid-liquid interfacial energy. For wetting to occur spontaneously, we must have uh, gamma SV minus gamma SL greater than zero, which means that the overall system tries to come to a lower energy, gamma SL. In other words, spontaneous wetting will occur when theta is less than 90 degrees. Generally, the contact angle between molten metals or alloys and most inorganic fibers is greater than 90 degrees, and it may range to 150 degrees or more. Hence, a spontaneous wetting is not possible. However, there are other ways of circumventing surface tension effects or improving wettability of the fibers, for example, addition of a suitable coating on the fibers, addition of certain elements in the metal. Surface uh, tension effects can also be bypassed the, through the casting process. There are several casting methods for fabricating composite materials using molten metals or alloys. These methods can be primarily divided into two categories. Firstly, those involving mixing of particles or fibers into molten metal, followed by purring into a mold or pressure casting into net shape in a die. And secondly, those involving infiltration of molten metal into a fiber preform, followed by solidification. In the second category, the casting methods may involve moderate to high pressures to aid in infiltration or to induce rapid solidification, or both. However, several issues are related to both methods. For example, a non-uniform distribution of particles or short fibers in the matrix may occur, that is, reinforcement clustering, settling, or pushing, the presence of isolated large reinforcement particles in the matrix, porosity and shrinkages formation during solidification, poor infiltration of the molten metal into the fiber preform, and finally, matrix reinforcement decohesion. All these issues can substantially influence the mechanical behavior of MMC's cast components in terms of tensile strength, fatigue strength, and wear and corrosion behavior. So how can X-ray microscopy contribute to study metal matrix composite materials? Some of these issues can definitely be investigated through X-ray microscopy. In particular, X-ray microscopy can be a powerful tool to understand the dynamic phenomena involved in the solidification of MMCs, namely entrapment, pushing and engulfment of solid particles at uh, solid-liquid interface and interface mor morphology evolution. Furthermore, results from X-ray radiographic experiments can provide solidification scientists and software developers with uh, valuable data leading to improved models and thus to optimization of MMC casting processes. Fundamental experiments would start from single particle interactions with the planar and curved interfaces, and then investigations would consider more complex multiparticle scenarios. 
adjusting several parameters such as the type of reinforcement, particle size, particles concentration, and growth velocity of the solid liquid interface will allow solidification scientists to find adequate answers to problems that still remain unsolved in the solidification of metal matrix composites. Thanks uh, for your attention and I look forward to your comments and questions. <laughs>